Hi everyone, my name is Mathieu and I have the pleasure to introduce this next talk. Keep in mind that for external speakers, we don't have any breakout rooms, so ask your question on the live chat and we'll take as much as we can at the end of the talk. So uh, Mozilla is, a well, is well known for its uh, web browsers, Mozilla Firefox, and its pledge for a better internet. While Mozilla and Ubisoft are very different companies, our games and Firefox do have a lot in common. For instance, Firefox is shipped every seven weeks on various OSs, including four versions of Windows, five versions of macOS, an infinite amount of Linux flavors, and of course, almost an infinite amount of iOS and Android versions. Beneath the curtains, Firefox is a huge and mostly CPP project with almost 20 years of code history, very much like our own games. They even have 3D acceleration with WebGL and a VR engine in Firefox for VR experiences in the browsers. Yep, you heard that right, uh, in, uh, in browser virtual reality engine. To put it simply, we face similar challenges across the board and one of these challenges is telemetry and how to responsibly monitor our systems running on our clients' machines. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome Chris, Chris is a Firefox telemetry engineer and data steward at Mozilla. He is responsible for data collection in Firefox. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot Chris, for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthew, for such a kind introduction. Um, as Matthew said, um, hi, I'm Chris Onjavsky, and this talk is about responsible data collection and how it is good, actually specifically how responsible data collection practices at Mozilla have proven not only to satisfy Mozilla's own strict standards for responsibility, but also how it's good business sense. So as mentioned, I work at Mozilla, you know, the Firefox people. Mozilla is more than just a web browser company, actually. We are often in the news championing users' rights for privacy and open access. We have a manifesto proclaiming our values-based thinking that the internet is a global resource that should be open and available to all. And the Mozilla Foundation also publishes privacy-focused work like Privacy Not Included, our tech buying guide, which has spurred manufacturers to improve their collection and handling of user data. We do a lot more than browsers, is my point, I guess. At Mozilla, I'm the owner of the telemetry module, which means I'm responsible for the data collection system in Firefox desktop. We call it telemetry to bring to mind NASA sorts of things. We have software that's out there that's sending back readings of where it is, what it's doing, and how it's performing. Our cross-platform telemetry data collection system is called Glean. You'll see that name crop up throughout the presentation when I talk about telemetry. You can find it here if you want to take a look. It's open source, and we are Mozilla after all, but it's not ready to be used by other organizations without some serious customization, at least for now. Now, telemetry is in contrast to operational data, like uh, how many hits are reaching our pocket top stories or how many new subscriptions we got to our Mozilla VPN, available now in Canada, France, and six other countries worldwide. Operational data is stuff our systems respond to. Telemetry is more of a one-way channel. In addition to telemetry things, I'm also on the data stewardship steering committee. That, that means I think about policy and privacy and processes when it comes to data as well. I'll get into what a data steward is at Mozilla a little later, but suffice to say that data is what I do at Mozilla. And so I'm here to talk to you about that. We have some care, we have some territory to cover today, but I'm leaving room at the end for questions. So please think up some questions, write them down as we go so I can answer them at the end. And if you can't think of anything to ask, please feel free to instead ask me about weird data things I've come across because I've seen things. So anyway, we'll be talking about responsibility. And when it comes to responsibility, I suppose we should start with who I think we're responsible to or to whom we are responsible, I don't mind. After we answer that, I will show you how it influences Mozilla's culture of responsible data collection and what processes and practices that entails. And then, only then, can I show you the good, actually. And I'm not just talking about good for you like the vegetables your parents overcooked for you as a kid. I'm talking about good, like the vegetables you roast for yourself now that you're an adult. So who are we responsible to? Well, there is a bit of a list. Um, we are responsible to ourselves. We want to do things we think are right and that don't make our lives difficult. We're responsible to our coworkers who were on the same side after all. We're responsible for not making their lives difficult either. 
we're responsible to our employer. We signed a contract and oh yeah, and we're responsible for regulatory and legislative oversight. Uh, hmm. Well, I'm not a lawyer, so that means I'm not, I'm just not going to mention how much responsible data collection helps answer GDPR requests for information. I'm not even going to suggest how collecting less data and retaining it for less time could make you less attractive of a target for hackers or law enforcement agencies who might want to get their claws into the data that you store. No, any advice I give you in this talk is friendly advice, not legal advice. Seek appropriate representation for anything else. And with posteriors predominantly protected, let's proceed. The most important responsibility, at least that Mozilla, is to our users. You know, those people who interact with our software and break it, the ones who complain about it online, the ones who will drop our products at the first difficulty and run to a competitor. Okay, well, that's a little bit unfair because, I mean, what would our products be without them? They, our users, are the reason we're doing this after all. And they are doing us the favor of using the product, which generates for us data. It's a lovely virtuous cycle. Users use the product. We get data on their usage and we use the usage data to improve the product. And then the users use the product again and more. But it does rather put a lie to something I used to say. I used to say Firefox telemetry is about measuring Firefox, not Firefox users. And I liked saying that it's not not wrong. I mean, it's emotionally true. We intend to do this, but there is no usage without users. We might think the number of HTTP connections is a purely technical consideration that we're measuring the product, not the human, but someone, some human pushed a button to kick off those connections. So we have a responsibility to our users. They are so helpfully generating data for us by using our products after all, so we have a duty to treat them and that data well. But what does well even mean? So at Mozilla, our responsibility to our users when it comes to data is tied up with our thoughts on privacy. And yes, I know, Kato Supriz, a Mozillian is talking about privacy. Enhanced tracking protection, Mozilla VPN, Firefox Monitor, Lockwise. It's, it's like we think security and privacy is important or something. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I could go on. But this is a talk about responsibility, not privacy. They're not interchangeable then. But they offer interesting things to say about each other. Mozilla's five data privacy principles are about privacy front and center. It's in the name. But they also lay out a framework of responsibility towards our users. We are responsible for not surprising our users with what we collect. Our users trust Firefox by putting a lot of personal information into it. We have mailing addresses, credit card numbers, things that would be wildly surprising to our users were we to collect that as data. So we don't. We are responsible for providing obvious and powerful controls for our users to turn off data collection if they don't want to participate. In Firefox, this takes the form of a single checkbox that if you uncheck it means that not only will we stop collection data right then, and stop collecting data right then, we'll even send a deletion request to our servers to request that the data we have collected is wiped out. We are responsible for only collecting the limited data we need and getting rid of it as soon as we can. Uh, Mozilla has actually published a whole website full of resources for building your own culture of collecting limited data called leandatapractices.org, which you can check out after the talk. We are responsible for the design of our product's data collection systems. Our data collection system, Glean, for example, won't even let you collect data unless the data has been reviewed. The product would fail to even build. And we are responsible to defend the data we do collect. I'm just going to cop out and put a lock icon here. Um, one of the best defenses we have is by not storing much that anyone besides Mozilla would find valuable. Mozilla wants to know that our JavaScript engine got faster in, in Firefox 89, but no one else does. These five points are an, an inherent part of Mozilla's cultural framework. This is bedrock stuff, foundational, and from that firm place to stand, all Mozilla needs is a lever to move the world. With apologies to Archimedes. And though today I am going to be lauding how our responsible approach is unsurprising, and we are exceedingly proud of the design of our data collection system Glean, as you can tell from the banner over my right shoulder, most of what Mozilla's responsible data collection focuses on is collecting only the right data, just the limited set that matters to Mozilla that we can responsibly and unsurprisingly collect from our users' Firefoxes. So the most responsible data collection is no data collection at all, right? Well, 
Betteridge's law of headlines says that any headline ending in a question can be answered with the word no. And that question on the screen, though rhetorical, isn't a headline, but the answer is still no. Collecting nothing might be the most private. I think that's just axiomatically true, but it isn't responsible. And I have an example to illustrate. So who here knows what ALSA is? ALSA is the advanced Linux sound architecture. It's a thingamajig in Linux that tries to make audio work. Back in 2016, one of our senior platform engineers, Anthony Jones, made the case that Firefox should stop supporting ALSA. He made the case in a well thought out thread on one of Mozilla's developer mailing lists. We still have these mailing lists, by the way, if you're interested in participating in or just observing modern software engineering design and decision making, subscribe to some, get involved. But as I was saying, we were willing to turn off our ALSA backend because we had a different backend using Pulse Audio that was much more pleasant to work with and much more featureful, which was important. We needed features like multi-channel audio for all that 5.1 stuff that Netflix and YouTube were sending our way over HTML5 video. And WebRTC was finally working everywhere except iPhone. So we needed something that could handle microphones and speakers simultaneously. But was anyone using ALSA? Would turning off ALSA, our ALSA backend cause users audio to just not work? Well, we had telemetry back then, so it was a simple-ish matter to instrument the backend selection algorithm and see who was using it. It didn't take too long for data to come back that it was only a small number of users who couldn't use Pulse Audio. And some of those were likely on Linuxes who built their own Firefox, and so they could turn the ALSA backend back on and maintain it themselves if they wanted it. So we turned it off. And for months, everything's fine. And, and then suddenly the web grew silent for a large number of users. 13 bugs are filed. The mailing list thread is revived with some unprofessional language. Turns out there are entire Linux distributions that ship stock Firefox, but no Pulse Audio. How did we miss this? Well, those same Linuxes who didn't ship Pulse Audio also turned off Firefox telemetry. They thought it was important for their users' privacy to do so, which might be true, but they probably also thought it was responsible. I failed to see how their users were served by having their communication lines back to Mozilla cut off because that's what telemetry is, a communication channel. It's how we hear what our users find useful or engaging or fun in our products. It's how we know that things are going well or what things aren't. In my opinion, these Linux distributions by cutting off that communication channel acted irresponsibly. Now, I'm not saying that you have to submit data back to Mozilla or you're a bad Linux, no GNU slash biscuit. We provide many, many communication channels to help influence the direction of Firefox development. This whole thing started on a mailing list, remember? Those Linuxes could have kept the lines of communication open by engaging with us on the mailing list if they were so keen on turning off telemetry. So, no, I do not believe that zero data collection is responsible, certainly not to users. In this instance, maybe it was okay. Maybe all we did was stop folks from listening to YouTube for a few days in 2016, but maybe we did more. Maybe people couldn't do their jobs. Maybe users were thrust into the open tentacles of Chrome. And maybe next time it won't be something as superficial as audio. In my considered opinion, data collection is an important tool for user empowerment, but we have to be careful. So if responsible data collection is about collecting data to avoid breaking audio in Linux, well, on purpose, while respecting our users' desires for privacy, what does that look like? Let's walk through an example so I can show you how it underlines our responsibility. Say you're a Firefox contributor, and as the community managers compel me to advertise, every one of you can be a contributor to Mozilla's mission to make a better internet, no coding required. You can help us translate strings, organize events, or participate in other volunteer activities. And if you do enjoy coding, we have projects in languages from Java to JavaScript, Python to Perl, C++ to Rust to Swift to Go. Operators are standing by to mentor you on good first bugs. Make your first contribution today. Right, where was I? Uh, say you've added a new feature to Firefox desktop and want to make sure it is actually being used by real people. It's a better profile switcher that makes it easier to swap between different Firefox configurations. And it's so neat, you even got your brother-in-law to design this cool logo for it. It's in the hamburger menu. It has a shortcut key. You hold control and then B and then P and then S all at the same time. It's very ergonomic. 
but you aren't sure whether it's being used and when it is used, if it's behaving well. So reflect a moment on how you do that. How do you instrument something new like this? You probably have a default way of thinking about feature engagement, right? Maybe you want to count the number of times the feature is presented and see how often users engage with it, some sort of impression or to activation ratio. Maybe you also want to see how users found the features, record some events along the way, you know, that, uh, that menu, that shortcut key, that help topic. Maybe performance, maybe you're a low level person and you want to make sure the profiles are switching quickly. And um, other stuff, maybe, I guess. How do you figure what is, how do you figure out what is important to instrument and what shape that instrumentation should take? When I start thinking about instrumentation, I ask myself a question. What questions do I hope to answer with these data? It's a really helpful question. It gets me thinking not only about what I need to collect, but how I hope to analyze it later. For, for our example, our new feature, our better profile switcher, I could record an event on every impression and again on every activation. But then to get my ratio, I'd have to search through every event in the data set and group them down and count them. And uh, so what if I could just record the ratio directly? Hmm? Two numbers grouped together, save me some time on the analysis side. Also makes it easier to test on the client side when it's just a couple numbers. And it's less data, so let's go with that. All this from asking what questions need answering. It's such a useful question. We at Mozilla came up with a way to make everyone answer it. So who likes forms? If this were an interactive session in meet space instead of in the theater of unprecedented times, this would be a decent place to add some audience engagement. A chuckle would run through the crowd as one enthusiastic person in the back sticks up their arm. I see you, you form nerd, you, I think you're great. At Mozilla, to add or expand any data collection in any project, you must complete a data review request form. A data steward must review your request and prepare a data review response form. So let's take a look at this review request. Question one, right off the bat, here's that good question. Love this question. Question two is forcing you to stand in Mozilla's shoes and our users' shoes. Justify that the data is even necessary. Maybe you care, but Mozilla doesn't, and our users don't benefit, so we shouldn't collect it. But in our case, the success of better profile switching is important to everyone. Question three, to rephrase this one, could we just not? Maybe we could instead do a focused user research study where we get users to explore better profile switching in person. Maybe we can look for trends in bug reports. Neither of these will work for us in this case. Better profile switching is heading for a worldwide audience, so user research won't scale affordably, and users don't file bugs like they used to. Question four, show your work. Tell me you've looked and couldn't find anything already there that would serve. Two data points for the same thing will just ensure one is always wrong. Which one? Depends on the day. In our case, better profile switching is new, so there's no risk of overlap. Question five is a list of the data so people don't have to go chasing through batch sets to find it all. This part I actually just automated on June 9th with a little feature on Glean Parser. Question six is has always, always has the same answer for our telemetry systems, and the answer is the Glean Dictionary. However, not every Mozilla project is using Glean just yet. Some websites are even using Google Analytics. This form still applies though, so you need to write and host data docs manually in that case. Question seven and eight are about limiting the amount of data we end up collecting. Maybe you only need data from regions of the world where we've advertised better profile switching. Question seven also identifies the person who's responsible, there's that word again, for this data collection over its lifetime. Question nine is like question six, the same for our telemetry systems. There is an option for opting out of data collection in all of Mozilla's products in the settings under privacy. But we still need this question for projects that don't use them. For example, those websites that use Google Analytics. To opt out of those, you need to set the do not track, do not track flag. And yes, Mozilla websites respect do not track. Do not act surprised, someone had to. Question 10 forces you to say that you actually have a plan for how to analyze this. If you don't think about analysis before adding new data, chances are that you'll add the wrong data. For better profile switching, we intend to use our in-house tooling to monitor and report on the results by tracking the engagement ratio over time. And I guess we want to purge geography too, now that you think about it. We should make sure that's in place before we begin. 
Question 11 provides an outgoing link to where we will publish results if we're publishing them. It's another one of those things you should think of when instrumenting. You tend to do a better job naming things if you know it's destined for, for public scrutiny. Question 12 is a new one to make sure that the data collection system we want to use is up to our standards of user choice, no surprises, less data, and all the rest. The answer is usually no, the answer is usually clean. And for pro better profile switching, it certainly is. And that's it. That's the form. Completing this form is a big step on the road towards responsible data collection. It's, a, it's about looking before you leap, thinking before you act. It turns data collection from an adolescent wild west into a world where you are expected to adult. It may seem like a lot of work, but it's worth it. Data collection is important. It's powerful. It's dangerous in the wrong hands. We owe it to our users to treat it seriously and sensibly. And that's why we empower data stewards to check our work and make sure we don't cut any corners. It's a data steward's job to look at the contents of this review request and determine if you pass. If anything is missing, it goes back to the requester. If anything isn't obviously acceptable under the privacy notice, the steward will kick it up to legal to have the final say. Okay, so who are these data stewards? At Mozilla, data stewards are volunteers who have just a little training and some resources to review data reviews. They come from throughout the organization. They can be anyone who has an interest in data. And any data steward can review any collection since it involves reviewing the form, not the code. This means that the review requester pays extra attention to filling out the form well, since you don't necessarily know who the person checking your answers will be. The data steward has their own form too. It is very creatively called the data review response, and it mostly serves as an explainer to everyone for what the, data, for what the steward is looking for in a review, so we don't need to go through it. Sorry to the form nerd in the back. You can look up the form yourself at the link below. The important thing to note is that these forms get you to justify to some random other person and to yourself that the data you're asking for is necessary, important, and has someone to keep an eye on it over its lifetime. This is what does most of the heavy lifting of ensuring we're being responsible to our users. Our users can trust that we can justify to at least one other person why this data must exist, and that's powerful. After the forms, or before them, or at the same time, you have to tell our data collection system, Glean, about the data you wish to collect. So you want to know how your new feature is being used. You're going to want a, a timing distribution for performance, a rate of impressions to activations, and an event to see what order users bump through the menus. And this is what that looks like. These are excerpts from a YAML file in the source directory of Firefox. You can see we have three definitions, one for the performance aspect, another for the activation ratio, and a third for the breadcrumb event. Each of these have high level types and metric type specific extra fields, but most of each of them are some core responsibility focused fields. You'll notice that each of these has a description that supports rich text in Markdown. Take as many words as you'd like to describe this metric. This helps explain what the data is about, ensuring that our users can better understand what we're doing. They also have outgoing links. The first are to the bugs where the data was added and changed. These are more for Mozilla's benefit than our users, as it tells us where to find out things like where in the code it lives and how often it's being updated. There are also outgoing links that lead to the data reviews for this collection. They link to those lovely answers to that lovely form we just went through. This links the definition, the what we collect, to the data review, the why. You can also see emails of interested persons. I'm the only one there. That's my actual email address. Feel free to drop me an email after the talk if you think of questions later. But it is a list field that can accept any number of entries. This serves both as a list of people you can ask questions of about this collection and a list of people you should let know about changes to it. Any automated system monitoring for regressions or checking expiry dates will send emails to these folks. Speaking of expiry dates, each definition has an expiry. If if you intend to use this collection to answer a question, then once you have enough data collected to answer it, it can automatically turn itself off. So for the engagement ratio and wayfinding event, we're expecting we'll know by Firefox version 100 whether we're having impact. But it might be that you expect to need a collection in perpetuity, and that's okay, but you have to declare it. The performance metric will be monitored for regressions for as long as better profile switcher exists. So we're declaring it as needing never ending collection. And last but not least, we have a data classification, so we can, we can sort these definitions by their independent privacy risk. 
We don't as yet have a good way to assess combined risk of multiple pieces of data in concert, things like fingerprinting and de-anonymization risk, but we can at least make what we do know explicit. At Mozilla, we have four categories of data collection, technical, interaction, stored communications, and highly sensitive. And as you can imagine, we don't have a lot of that last one, the highly sensitive one, but it's important to be able to find it, which this field helps with. For better profile switching, both the engagement rate and the event are generated through interaction with the product, which means that they're marked interaction. Whereas the timing distribution is technical. Though come to think of it, we could use the number of timing samples in that metric to figure out how often and when the user decided to interact with better profile switching. So maybe we should bump that up to interaction. These metric definitions serve our responsibility to our users by linking together important pieces of information in as obvious a fashion as possible. That way, no matter where a user lands in their pursuit of information about a data collection, they are just a few clicks away from learning the what and the why of it. Come now, how could we possibly make calling an API responsible? You can't expect I'm going to sit here and show you that somehow the way we designed our instrumentation APIs is responsible. I mean, I will, but you shouldn't have expected it. You see, if you build an API that just takes two things, a name and a value, then absolutely everything can be in that name and value. But if you use the definitions I just finished talking about to generate an API that forbids you from collecting the wrong things, well, this is how you'll instrument better profile switching using the rate, events, and timing distribution we defined. See how the name isn't a parameter. You can't get it wrong without causing the build to fail and you can't accidentally slip in data or call it something else other than what you know something other than what's in the definition and the data review everything uses the type system to ensure you don't collect the wrong data and for situations like events which are in javascript where the type system is uh, underpowered we know because you told us in the definition that the number of profiles needs to be a quantity and if it isn't we can record an error preventing us from recording the wrong thing and highlighting an instrumentation fault at the same time and testing is just as straightforward just call test get value and wrap it in an assert the whole point is to make it as easy to test as it is to instrument and with the definitions files providing a list of all metrics in the product we even generate coverage reports for which instrumentation is and is not tested because untested instrumentation would be irresponsible all right, so what have we learned? We've learned we've, we are responsible most to our users. By learning from privacy principles, we can develop an understanding of what such a responsibility entails. But remember from our trouble with audio on Linux that privacy isn't always responsible. And from our understanding of responsibility, we can design processes, data formats, and even APIs to ensure responsibility. And that, that's, that's good, right? Is good actually? Well, maybe. We're doing all this work when a simple send a beacon with this stuff in it would allow us to collect the same data, just JSON up the place and sort it out at the back end. Responsibility doesn't have to be in processes and formats and APIs. Why be this heavyweight? Why do all this work imbuing tools and formats and everything with the essence of responsibility when you could get away with not doing any of that and just cleaning up responsibility spills when or if they become a problem? Okay, it's time for the mid talk turnaround where I show you that all this extra work we're doing actually does what I claimed in the talk synopsis. And uh, what was that again? Um, makes cataloging easy, uh, stops instrumentation mistakes before they ship, and allows you to build self serve analysis tooling that gets everyone invested in data quality. Oh, and it's cheaper too. We can do this. So, First and foremost, data catalogs. Data catalogs by their nature aid responsibility. We are collecting all this data, but unless it's discoverable and understandable, it'll never be used. And then why did we bother collecting it in the first place? Unused but collected data is irresponsible. It's risky, it's inefficient, and it's costly. No, no, you need a catalog to improve responsibility. But responsibility doesn't just flow out of cataloging. Responsible data collection makes cataloging easy, well, or at least easier. Mozilla's responsible data collection in particular is a heck of a lot easier to catalog than data collection via beacons of unknown structures sent to Google Analytics or whatever. This is mostly due to the definitions files. We use these definitions files in a way, ah, my apologies. I have scrolled back my notes and so I'm going to scroll forwards.
This is mostly due to the definitions files. This is the single source of truth about our instrumentation, and it contains outgoing links to higher level concerns about its implementation and rationale. Mozilla first introduced these definitions files for their responsibility effects, but have since realized that it can supply so much more information beyond just that. We are using our definition files at Mozilla for schema generation, data set generation, and tooling. You add a new data point to a definitions file, and within a day, our ingestion service has been updated to parse and validate it. And our data sets have added fresh new columns for them to live in. And our business intelligence tooling knows from the new data points metric type, which operations are and aren't useful on it, and can show and hide them as appropriate. If you'd like a concrete example, let's think about sending a single data point that's a number. If you're sending a number, your data tools can't tell what you might find interesting to do with it. If you're sending a counter, like how many web pages you've visited, you want to sum it and know the count of clients who have visited more than zero of them. You can see this in Mozilla's Looker instance. It's not public, I'm afraid, so here's a screenshot, but no URL, as common measures for countable things are auto-populated. If you're sending a quantity, like uh, how many displays, monitors your users have, or, or their height and width in pixels, summing them doesn't really make sense, but you'll still want to filter and facet by that as a dimension. If that number is actually a point in time, like the time the data was submitted to our pipeline, then we should emphasize its use as an independent variable. And if it's a span of time, well, we'll need the unit too, and then we can use it to normalize other values. Not pictured here because we haven't done that one yet. Defining what these data are is responsible, and it pays dividends all the way through your pipeline to your tooling. Once you have this metadata system running through your data ecosystem, adding a catalog on top, like the Glean Dictionary, is straightforward. Well, not that web development is ever straightforward, but it isn't the Herculean task you'd be facing without such a system backing you up. Add in a user writable field for annotations and you have an always up to date catalog down to the level of individual data points. You can browse through this yourself at dictionary.telemetry.mozilla.org if you want. Not now, you're busy paying close attention and I greatly appreciate that, but afterwards you can poke around and learn about every individual data point Mozilla thinks it's important to record in each of its products. On a scale from good actually to actually good, responsible data collection scores a two on cataloging. Too good, that is. Stopping instrumentation mistakes is an important thing for responsibility and is part of a broader theme of improving data quality. You don't want to accidentally record the user's email address when all you wanted to do was record whether there was an email address. You also don't want your analysts to find out that the number you're sending is actually the memory address of the number instead. This is where a responsible API pays dividends. I spoke already about how we leverage the type system to prevent obvious mistakes and make testing so simple that your instrumenting developers write tests as a matter of habit, but it goes even deeper than that. And apologies to people who don't read C++, but see how the timer ID comes out of start and then gets moved back in to stop or cancel? You can't stop a timer twice if we take its ID away from you. And just notice we're not letting people do timing themselves. You don't hand us some milliseconds you found yourself falling off the back of a truck. You're using the timing logic we've provided. Time is one of the three hardest things in computers. In, in order, they are time, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. We do our best to solve time once and hide it behind the API so that time works the same across platforms and products and ecosystems. And in addition to this, data quality is improved by responsible data collection through the forms, by not collecting the same data twice, by thinking about analysis and publication at the point of instrumentation, when it's early enough to fix things, and through ensuring new data collections actually matter. And this isn't to say that this is foolproof. We at Mozilla still lose time to data quality faults by instrumenting the wrong thing and not noticing until analysts take a look, sometimes much later. But this seems to happen most frequently when we get sloppy on allowing low quality answers and data review requests. The more rigorously the standards are applied, the fewer times we have to rip out a collection and start over. Now, this wouldn't be a talk at a data conference if I didn't have a slide about data democratization. I, I, I do think we're beyond the era where people are still talking about how to get query prompts in front of, every, in front of anyone who wants one. I think we're past the point where anyone from finance to biz dev to engineering to QA can log in with their single sign on and start fighting with SQL or clicking around Tableau or Looker or something with the rest of us, right? To me, data democratization isn't about access anymore. It's about understanding. And it's not about making understanding available either. Everyone you know with is smart. Everyone you work with is smart enough to write SQL or use NumPy. Jupyter notebooks aren't mountains you need breathing equipment to climb. 
But everyone's busy. Devs are busy. So why would they be interested in analysis? Analysts are busy. So why would they be interested in instrumentation? Everyone is busy applying their own expertise. How can you get them interested in the other parts of the data? And come to think of it, what could this have to do with responsible data collection? So when I was going through the forms, yes, the forms again, I think the form nerd in the back might have been the only one who noticed this. No shade to the rest of us. We just don't think the same way. Apologies to anyone who already caught this as well. But let me draw a couple things to your attention with a device of rhetorical questions. Who is filling out this form? And what kind of questions are being asked of them? And now allow me to answer these questions because not only are they rhetorical, but the way talks work is that I do all the talking until the question part, which is coming up. So who is filling out this form? Instrumenters are filling out this form, typically application developers or engine developers or front end developers or people who are writing code. But we're asking them to answer questions about product and policy concerns. We're asking them to survey the whole corpus of currently recorded data to see if they're duplicating work. We're getting them to think about analysis and publication and how to best communicate the instrumentation to some data store they might never have met. We're getting an instrumenter, a developer, interested in the entire data environment. And when a data steward, a volunteer from the corner of the organization who has just a, some interest in data, comes in and reads this, they're involved in the same complete data picture. This form is cross-functional magic sauce. I'm not really a form nerd, but I like this one. As a data steward, I'm party to a whole whack load of new data that's being added. And as an instrumenter, I'm forced to think of a data point's entire life cycle when I instrument it. This so good, actually. And now we talk about how this saves you money. The easy through line from responsible data collection to cost reduction is how receiving less data costs less bandwidth and storing it saves on hard drive costs, which are starting to spike jumping chimney. And so, yeah, that's uh, that part done. Time to move on to conclusions and questions. But really, this is the smallest part of what responsible data collection saves you. With those definitions files, feeding a metadata info service that underpins your data catalog, your data engineers are freed from manual schema updates. With all this rich metadata about your data, you can automate the derivation of data sets. Heck, you can automate analyses and reporting and monitoring in some instances. With the improvements to data quality from responsible API design, you'll spend less time fixing instrumentation and more time simply using it. And both of these, though impactful, pale in comparison to the big winner, the big saver. I'll bet that responsible data collection looked most expensive when I was telling you about this form, right? Every single one of these questions, and you need to answer every single one of them before you can get back to your real work of actually instrumenting the product. Well, first off, data review happens simultaneously with code review. Sometimes data review takes longer, sometimes code review takes longer. The point is it doesn't slow you down as much as it looks like it does. I mean, you do have to take the time to consider the questions and write the answers, so it's not free, but let me ask you this. How many of these questions do you have to answer about a data point? As an instrumenter, as an analyst, as a decision maker, how many times do people ask you why the data behaves the way it behaves? How many times do people ask you who owns this data? How many times are you asked, is it supposed to do that? Answering this form isn't a cost you're spending to get access to responsible data collection. It's not an admission fee. It clears the way for your instrumenters to implement the collection with confidence. It's an investment in documentation. It's ensuring your data catalog is always up to date. It's giving your analysts the answers to questions that block their analyses. It's answering questions once that are asked dozens of times, democratizing the understanding of your data across the organization. It's invaluable and cheap at the price. And when it comes to things that save you money, I would love to put figures on a slide. It saves X dollar bucks, uh, reduces support calls by Y percent, you know the type, but we've been doing this for so long at Mozilla, I don't have anything to compare it to. I just don't know. The best I can do is put this in terms of investment. The Mozilla Corporation has fewer than 900 employees. That's including finance, engineering, ops, HR, IT, and management, everybody. And our data tools team, it's called the data warehouse and applications team now, but the team devoted to this work, they're fully eight of these people. If the democratization of data understanding wasn't important and worthwhile, and an organization the size of Mozilla, and with a focus on privacy and collecting as little data as is necessary as Mozilla, 
would surely have invested differently, don't you think? I mean, how many people is 1% of your organization? 20, 200? What would you invest 1% of your organization on? Oh, and this isn't the whole data org, no. I'm not one of those eight. We're altogether maybe 40-ish people working on the technical and infrastructure and analysis pieces to support products that reach hundreds of millions of users around the world. Yeah. I'm not expecting everyone to be able to emulate this. Mozilla is a unique case. Though there is a whole ecosystem of organizations demanding and creating a better internet, Mozilla is unique even within that niche. And so I acknowledge that just because responsible data collection is working for us doesn't mean it will work for you. But there is some stuff in here that I really think you should take a closer look at. The biggest bang for your buck is the definitions files. You want rich metadata attached to your instrumentation. You need this information for your catalog. Build it into the product itself. From there, you can use developer tooling to generate responsible APIs that give you a needed boost in data quality. And you can start or bolster a testing culture, and you can automate at the least interesting data infrastructure tasks, freeing up pipeline developer time to do clever things. What sorts of clever things? Well, I mean, you could query your queries. Have you ever looked into access patterns? Which data points are the most popular? Which ones are accessed only on Mondays? It's, it's wonderful stuff. We did this for our public, our public measurement dashboard a few years back and learned absolutely no one was interested in any data more than six months old, except for this one person. Because once every few months, they'd hit the endpoint and drag ages and ages of data to do with SSL and crypto algorithms and other neat web standards-y stuff, stuff like this, the percentage of Firefox nightly page loads that are encrypted, the HTTPS, not just HTTP. It turned out that our CTO, Eric Rescorla, has a library of custom scripts used to track years-long trends in aggregate web standards behavior. He wanted to use Firefox as a means to measure the web to see how quickly new standards he helped develop were being adopted. When we figured this out and saw the alignment with Mozilla's web standards work, we started to publish a data set of the proportion of Firefox page loads that are encrypted across the entirety of the Firefox population. Let's Encrypt, the certificate authority that grants free HTTPS certificates to over 250, Mozilla, uh, 250 million domains and counting, uses it to power their stats page. You're welcome to use it too, of course. Mozilla likes to publish what it can to help demystify its work. You can find most of it listed on telemetry.mozilla.org. One of the things listed there is the Firefox public data report at data.firefox.com, where we look at the population of Firefox users. There's a bunch of stuff in there, but you might find it most interesting to contrast the hardware makeup of Firefox clients versus your clients. I imagine the GPU numbers could be wildly different. I mean, in Firefox users, Intel is the GPU manufacturer of choice with almost 70% of clients for over two years running. We only plot the last two years, but the data goes back to 2016 when Intel was only 60%. Hopefully I haven't distracted you too much with the pretty graphs and you see how querying your own access patterns can give you some really keen insights. Adopt more responsible data collection practices and data engineering might have enough resources to look into this. So aside from the definitions files, I highly recommend any data collecting organization should adopt some sort of data review. Yes, that form again, no, you don't have to use the same form, but listen, there's this study of Cisco code reviews that SmartBear did back in 2006. They found that the surest way to reduce de defects was code review, which is not a big surprise when SmartBear is the creator of the Code Collaborator code review tool. But the weird thing was it wasn't the code review itself that did it. Preparing the code to be reviewed allowed patch authors to catch their own mistakes before even reaching review. Deeply investigating your own proposed changes catches mistakes, at least in code. Naturally, there's no study for data reviews, at least not yet, but I expect a similar practice holds. By getting an instrumenter to explain themselves to themselves, you reduce the number and severity of defects in the underlying instrumentation. This saves you time, which saves you money, and makes people more confident in their work, which makes them happier. Plus, just before instrumentation lands is a wickedly good time to hook in additional practices of your own. At Mozilla, Data Science has suggested that maybe they they would like a chance to double check work at that time so that instrumentation doesn't escape into the product that answers a similar but less useful question to the ones they want to answer. And the product instrumentation team wouldn't mind an opportunity to ensure the names and descriptions are in line with the names and descriptions of similar probes in other products. And when this is brought up at Mozilla, I calmly note that the data stewardship program is always looking for more volunteers and then back quietly away. 
And if you're really charged up by the prospect of layering a level of responsibility onto your data processes, I recommend checking out Mozilla's leandatapractices.org, where there are learning materials and worksheets to help you set up a lean data practice in your own organization. Its focus is, its focus is on privacy, but though we've learned that it's not the same as responsibility, it is a decent starting point for sure. And with that, I've run out of obvious points that fit this particular broad spectrum narrative for why responsible data collection is good, actually. I'm not done talking about it. I could just keep going on forever. I mean, I have more technical details about why it's so good to have metric types that are higher level than just number or string or JSON blob, like how easy it makes regression detection. I have philosophical arguments for why your work shouldn't make you feel icky and how responsible data collection helps with that. I have a story about how I perform data archaeology using the forms and definitions I presented here to diagnose a severe and sudden change in a critical performance metric turns out it was a severely positive change, but I needed to find the data review to confirm it. But what I presented here are the highlights. I hope you found it interesting, if not compelling, straightforward, if not stimulating, and satisfying, if not good, actually. Anywho, thank you for listening. I think it's now time to open the floor for questions. All right. Thanks a lot for this awesome talk, Chris. Uh, I see a lot of chatters on uh, private and public chats everywhere in Ubisoft. So you definitely made a, a huge impact and uh, everyone is speaking already about uh, what to do next. Uh, we do have some questions um, related to the talk uh, directly. So I'm going to select uh, one of these, uh, a few of these, sorry, before we can um, you know, maybe open the floor for the, the weird, uh, surprising data you mentioned at the very beginning <laughs> that you stumbled upon. So um, the, the first one uh, will open with, uh, I can't imagine that the adoption of the form by development teams was an easy task to do. Can you talk about some reluctance that was met and how it was overcome? Well, surprisingly, hmm. Surprisingly, I've had very little friction adding data collection review to uh, the review process. Um, part of this is because um, by the time I started being involved with this, I uh, the, the concept of a data review was already in place. But a lot of it was an organizational cultural thing where we just didn't collect any data at all because we were scared of what it might, what risk it might bring to our users, what privacy risk specifically. And so by introducing this review, we actually relieved some pressure in the Mozilla organization, the little culture about how, uh, about our attitudes towards data and data collection. So right. the, the reluctance was really not there. Thanks. Um, oh, next, yes, go ahead. One, one follow up. Um, there was a bit of reluctance when um, everyone realized that they needed to fill out the form again when they renewed collections that expired, and that was a huge problem. And what we did then was we we added a new form just for renewals that had three questions in it that could be answered with a URL, a one-word answer, and a sentence. And then everyone was that was that was the only reluctance. Sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay, of course. So uh, the next one. Um, do you know the percentage of Firefox users that enabled the data collection or disabled it? I mean, okay. well, um, the basics of tele the basics of telemetry is enabled uh, by default across all of the channels, all of the release channels of Firefox. So it would be an opt out percentage, and the opt out percentage is rather small. It's in the uh, it's it's below ten percent um, at present. Measuring this, as you can imagine, is probably pretty hard. We can count the number of deletion requests we get, because as I mentioned, when you opt out, we send a deletion request to delete data. Um, but we don't know how many, we, we don't know whether those are short-lived users or whether those are users that are long-lived and then make a decision and then exist for a long period of time. So we have some interesting ways of measuring that, that we, or estimating that rather, that we had to go into to get those numbers. But fairly low and a non-representative sample. All right, thanks. Um, uh, a more open-ended open question. Uh, what's your opinion on differential privacy? Uh, differential privacy is an interesting approach to um, solving the privacy aspects of responsibility. 
um, where uh, something like randomized response or a situation like rapport or prio um, would allow you to get precise answers or get statistical answers of privacy focused questions. We've looked into a few uh, differential privacy setups in the past, including Rapport and Prio. Uh, Rapport didn't end up looking like it would work out very well for us in the long tail because it was a statistical based model. Um, Prio has, is showing some really good progress, uh, really good uh, potential, and we have some interesting research and development work on Prio that uh, we think will, will bear some fruit. So overall, I'd say we are roughly positive in the direction of differential privacy, and we think that it can solve some classes of data collection problems. All right, thanks a lot. Um, during the talk, you said that the definition of the metrics uh, is available uh, for anyone, if I understood correctly, uh, within the catalog, which is public. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know who is consulting this catalog? Is it mainly, you know, Firefox or Mozilla's employees or are the actual users of Mozilla interested by the definition of the metrics and the metrics that are, uh, you know, collected? Well, we don't. <laughs> Collecting data about data is fun. And so we do have a little bit of analytics on the catalog itself to see what's going on, but we don't have sort of audience knowledge we don't we can't identify that oh this user of the of the data catalog is a mozilla employee we don't have a bit that we can check for that so we don't actually know we have noticed that as we make sort of advertising pushes for the data catalog internally we see that number bounce up and and sort of trail off and then generally trend up and to the right but there seems to be a baseline of use that um, is not attributable to Mozilla employees. So we assume people are finding it on the open web, but it might also be robots. All right, all right. Um, another we, one. We sorry, we we design we design it assuming that the public is looking at it, is the important thing. So uh, another one then. Uh, can you talk in more details about how you handle uh, deletions on the technical side? What do you do when you receive a deletion request? So when we receive a deletion request, it contains the anonymous identifier. Well, anonymous identifier is kind of a contradiction in terms, but it, it includes the UUID of the uh, of any of the systems that are identified by UUIDs. And then we, I believe, every 28 days we go back through all of history and we straight up delete the rows. We just go through and find anything that matches these IDs and we erase it as best we can. Well, I mean, we tell our cloud providers to do so and then they do it on our behalf. But uh, we also have a verification task to make sure that after it's done, that none of those IDs appear in our data sets. Um, you can ask more questions about that of, uh, of some of my colleagues on my team that I've that you would find us on chat.mozilla.org in the telemetry channel would be a good choice. All right. Uh, so that would be the, the last question. So it's uh, because you asked, what kind of surprising data did you stumble upon? Well, there are a variety of stories. I try my best to publish them on my blog when I can. Mozilla's big on openness, and so I, I publish as much about, about data as I have the time for. Um, one of my more recent one's stories is about how we discovered that there is a, that there are, well, when we released the Canadian translation of Firefox, the Canadian English specifically translation of Firefox, we discovered that there were more Canadians in India than there were in Canada. And um, it was, it was, it was, bo it was boggling because we didn't even tell anyone that it existed. We, we were released it the first time and we we're like, okay, we actually have an, a Canadian English uh, language pack. And so we put all the U's in place so that, you know, Harbor and Honor and all those fun things. And then we immediately, as soon as we released that, the uptick in adoption was a, basically a straight line upwards. And most of it was from India. So we didn't get a complete answer to this question, but what we did notice is that on download sites like our FTP site and like our download, you know, our list of all languages, we happen to notice that English Canada, EN-CA, is the first English variant we release. 
alphabetically speaking. And so we assume that because it was basically a straight line, it couldn't possibly have been humans, that it must have been robots in India that were going, okay, we need to, you know, we, we need to get to the topmost English. Or there was just a huge amount of pent up demand for Canadian English in India, one or the other. <laughs> well, really, really interesting, Chris. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for your, this uh, amazing talk. Uh, a lot of chatters, as I was saying, uh, that is currently happening on your ideas and your points everywhere that you researched already. Thanks you for your time, for being there. And uh, to everyone, I encourage you to, to have a go and see uh, Chris's blog or to uh, follow the various links that were present in the document in the presentation so you can learn even more about what's possible uh, data collection and how it is actually uh, good for you. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.